Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast, brought to you by Mayo Clinic. I'm your host, Dr. Andrea Tooley. And I'm Dr. Eric Bothan. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest in ophthalmology, medicine, and more. Today, we are joined by Dr. George Bartley, the Chief Executive Officer at the American Board of Ophthalmology. We get to discuss the maintenance of certification, ABO's efforts to create a virtual oral exam during the COVID pandemic, and the future of professionalism in medicine. Dr. George Bartley is the CEO of the American Board of Ophthalmology, the Chief Executive Officer Emeritus of Mayo Clinic in Florida, the Lewis and Evelyn Kruger Professor of Ophthalmology at the Mayo Clinic, and the 2020 Laureate of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Dr. Bartley is an oculoplastic surgeon and author of over 300 papers on topics ranging from oculoplastics to John Milton and baseball. He's a hero of mine. I'm so happy that you're here. Welcome, Dr. Bartley. Thank you. It's great to be here. I've so appreciated being your colleague here at the Mayo Clinic, and you have hats and expertise in a number of areas. Today, we're excited to talk a little bit about the ABO, and you certainly took the reins with a group of people there in leadership that um, has, in a tumultuous time, and led them through some meaningful changes in our mock process and our maintenance of certification process. I just would love to start by just take us through your perspective on the rationale behind some of those changes and where you see what we've done and changed to point and where you see it going in the, in the process of maintenance of certification for us as ophthalmologists. Sure, uh, thanks. Um, maybe a little historical context would be helpful to start. Um, the, the concept of maintenance of certification or continuing certification as now the American Board of Medical Specialties prefers to refer to it, uh, has it's been tumultuous, I think, probably since it started. And this really was probably back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, when the American Board of Family Practice was born. Uh, they never had a non-MOC world, if you will. Everyone who came in and got that certificate immediately was enrolled, if you will, in this process that you know your certificate was good for a certain number of years and it had to be renewed or recertified. The idea being that knowledge changes um, we change, our practices change, and that we should be, we as physicians should be demonstrating to our peers and to the public that we're keeping up. So the concept makes sense. Um, the other boards that constitute the American Board of Medical Specialties, you know, one by one adopted this. And in ophthalmology's case, there was a lot of discussion back in the 70s and 80s, I guess mainly in the 80s about this. It was controversial. Uh, a lot of doctors, of course, you know, sort of balked at the idea. Nobody really likes being overseen, and some doctors in particular really are quite resistant to the idea. Well, uh, the American Board of Ophthalmology in 1992 adopted this, uh, along with, like I said, other other boards as well. All the 24 boards now, of course, have adopted this uh, over over time, this this concept. Um, I guess the problem probably was is that, um, you know, the inclusiveness uh, of the community could have been probably better throughout all of medicine. Um, I, I think ophthalmology has probably had less problem or less tumult than maybe some of our other um, colleagues, other boards out there. But when when I took on this job five years ago, um, I would say that the uh, environment was a little challenging. The good news is that um, my colleagues uh, at the ABO had not been unaware of this, and my predecessor, John Clarkson, had instituted um, a process with the, uh, the board staff to gain input from our community to try to figure out how to make this process uh, better. Uh, we'll get, I guess, probably later into the idea of professional self-regulation, but it's pretty clear that somebody is going to regulate us in medicine, and um, to maybe not have a spoiler alert, but it's better for us to, to do it ourselves and for someone outside to probably do this. So it's important for the community to come together to, to do this properly. So there was focus groups being held and information was being gathered about how this could be done uh, more efficiently, less burdensomely, if that's a word, for our colleagues. And I just came on board at this time and, and with the help of our board staff, excellent board staff, um, uh, we've tried to make some improvements in the process. Long answer, I guess, or at least long response to your question. Happy to flesh that out a little bit more detail if you'd like. Yeah, I'm curious what the environment was with ABMS, the American Board of Medical Specialties, 
all these other medical specialties, right right when you took over ABO, there were civil suits and w- within other specialties, not ophthalmology. So had it all come to a head where our hand was kind of forced, we had to make a change in maintenance of certification or was ophthalmology being proactive in this? How did it all fit in with yeah. everybody, all the other specialties? Yeah, great, great question. It is complicated, like a lot of things. Um, there was a lot of negative press um, about uh, the finances of, of, of one or two of the other boards. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's collateral damage from that sort of thing, and people just hear what they hear, and it reinforces their biases or prejudices or whatever. And everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people said, gee, this is just a money grab. You know, this is the way people are, you know, how these boards are making money, and they're living high off the hog and all this sort of thing. I mean, the, the ABO's finances are totally transparent. They've been that way. We've made them more transparent during the last few years. But the reality is it just simply isn't true. You know, for the American Board of Ophthalmology, this has always been, at best, a break-even proposition, at least maintenance of certification has been. Um, So, you know, we were proactive. I think the ABO was proactive saying, well, we don't want to be on the wrong end of a lawsuit or the wrong end of of, uh, legislation, um, which was introduced in a number of states and still is being introduced in some places to try to force, if you will, hospitals and other groups not to consider maintenance of certification or continuing certification as a credential. Well, you know, that's an interesting approach. I think it's kind of myopic, to use an ophthalmic term, uh, mm-hmm. one that you understand better than I do as a pediatric ophthalmologist, Eric, and I'm just an oculoplastic guy. Give me, cut me a little slack here. Oh, okay? well, so I hope I use the word properly. Very much so. But, you know, the, the idea is, is that, you know, hospitals uh, use this as a credential. They have the right to do that and they're gonna use something as a credential, they find value in the credential. So, so far, these legislative efforts have, have not been terribly successful, and I think they're actually quite harmful uh, to medicine, and that's been written about in JAMA and other places about a potential threat to self-regulation. We, it's like the old thing that doctors are great at circling their wagons when there's a problem, but we, the problem is we start shooting inwards rather than out, mm-hmm. and that's not good for the profession. So we need to be I'm not circling the wagons, but we need to be working within the profession to make it better. You both know that I'm kind of interested in history, and you know this goes back more than a century. And Edward Jackson, more in the 19 teens, looked at the landscape at that time, and you know American medicine was kind of the Wild West. I mean, every, anyone could say they were a specialist or they were this or that, and you know the medical schools were wildly variable in their quality, and this which led to the Flexner Report in 1912, this sort of thing. But Edward Jackson, you know, smart guy, uh, he invented the Jackson cross cylinder, which is an unbelievably brilliant tool, right? You know, and used today around the world every day. But Jackson said something like, you know, that you know the answer with this, the current state of affairs in ophthalmology must be dealt with within the profession and outside of any legal, you know, external input. I mean, that's brilliant to mm-hmm. think, you know, that we got to do this ourselves, and that's why he and others. Uh, leaders in ophthalmology uh, came together and came up with this idea of a certifying board. It wasn't a unique idea. It had already been present in England, and they really followed kind of the example of what was doing going on in England and London in particular, and set this thing up. And it was totally voluntary, as it should be, as it is today. No one's forcing anyone to become board certified. But it was it was proactive, I guess, at the time, Andrew. You know that they were looking at a problem, tried to solve it from within. So we're just the you know inheritors of that legacy and at least now we're more proactive if you will, at least we hope we are trying to involve engage our colleagues to do this as a community uh, an ophthalmic community again another really long rambling answer to your really great questions great. so well and certainly through that time of change is the whole um, our views of maintenance of certification and a board uh, board certification um, were being reflected on Along came COVID. There's so many different pieces of our lives that became more challenging through this journey. And you've helped to lead that, the organization through a time of more of an evaluation of how we become certified and of going virtual. And my understanding is ophthalmology is the first specialty to have a virtual certification process. Is that the case? Pretty, it depends on how you look at the calendar, I guess. You yeah. know, we, American Board of Surgery, uh, also very proactive in this regard. And uh, I, th- I think we 
probably were the first board that completed its first cycle of all the you know, candidates for that year. But uh, they were looking at this closely. We were looking at it closely. We shared notes. That's one of the yeah. actually terrific uh, advantages of the American Board of Medical Specialties is that we, we being the various member boards, and particularly the surgical boards, we learn from each other. Uh, I'm, I'm almost, I'm not daily contact, but certainly weekly contact with my counterparts at the American Board of Plastic Surgery, ENT, neurosurgery, uh, you know, orthopedic surgery. I have called this afternoon, in fact, with my colleague from ENT to talk about certification matters, and we learn from each other. Okay. Um, so getting back to COVID, you know, we were pretty fortunate um, just because we had made the decision at the ABO to uh, dissolve our physical office uh, back in 2018. We had had a lease on an office space in Ballakinwood, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia, where our dozen or so you know, full-time staff people gathered daily, like everybody else did in America. You go to work, right? You know, commute, this sort of thing. And our lease was coming up. So I talked with uh, our administrator, Beth Ann Comber, and said, you know, let's think about maybe going virtual. Um, the model for this was when I was editor of the journal Ophthalmology, we, there was a physical office where people went and did the manuscript review stuff, you know, behind the curtain as this happens. And we ended up making that office virtual. And so that had worked quite well. Um, so we tried a little pilot project in the ABO and our uh, employees thought it was okay. And they didn't miss commuting in Philadelphia traffic. They could walk the dog, they could exercise at lunchtime, whatever. So they, <clears throat> they liked it. So we, we let our lease expire and we went virtual. So when, you know, COVID just sort of showed up uh, in late February, early March of 2020, and we had to go virtual, we were already there mm -hmm. and that was helpful. So, you know, we had an oral examination set up, and as I wrote in an editorial called When the Best Laid Plans Go Awry, we had decided to do one giant mega exam uh, in Phoenix, a new site, rather than traditional two exams, which is more expensive. The oral exam is very expensive to put on, very, and we lost a lot of money per candidate, and uh, we just couldn't sustain that. And so we thought, well, if we did it once a year, that's less money lost. And so we were going to do this in Phoenix, Arizona on March 18th, March 19th, something like that. So a little more than a week ahead of this, you know, COVID comes in. Um, we were conferring like crazy for the week during this, uh, my colleagues and I on the board. Uh, I was on vacation in St. Simon's Island and with uh, my friend Hans Grossnerklaas, who's now uh, on the board. And, and he remembered the whole time I was on my phone you talking. You enjoyed that vacation, <laughs> I'm <laughs> didn't, sure. I didn't, did not didn't enjoy have a vacation. <clears throat> I was talking with, with David Herman and others on the board at the time. Of, what, are we, what are we going to do here? So it was pretty clear to us, to me at least, you know, that when the lockdown in northern Italy happened, this was real and was going to be hitting us pretty soon. So we weighed the pros and cons, and uh, decided to pull the plug, if you will, on the oral exam. Part of this was because the examiners are all volunteers, um, every one of them, you know, and every person pays their own way, which a lot of people don't realize. The examiners pay their own way, to, they take time off from their practice, they fly to wherever on their own dime. We give them a room, you know, and give them some meals, but they do the exam, and so, you know, Suddenly, the examiners are saying, gee, my institution won't let me travel. I'm afraid to travel. What else? And that made sense. So we, we, we pulled the plug. The immediate response was not positive from a lot of people. This was on March 9th. Now, later that week, the NBA stopped. The Masters said we're not going to have a golf tournament, all this sort of thing. So we were just about two or three days ahead of the kind of the curve. So, but, you know, everybody had been preparing you know, you remember when you take your, we all remember this, oh, yeah. we took our boards and your, yeah. your head is full of all these, the differential diagnosis of leukocoria, whatever, all these things. And you don't want, don't talk to me because mm -hmm. I might, I might spill something out of my left ear here, you know? And so, uh, you know, That's everyone so was true. ready. It's so true, <laughs> yeah, right? You know, exactly. and you don't want to do that again. So yeah. you're, you're really primed for this exam. And we honored that. We, we wanted, you know, these young people who want to get on with their lives. And so we sent out a survey to the candidates and said, well, Here's the situation, you know, we, we're not going to have this exam. Um, should we, you know, have it later in the year, in October, uh, or next year? You know, give some options and, and go over, over go virtual, you know, with the understanding that no one had done this. It had been tried on a couple pilot projects and hadn't, done, hadn't gone well. And overwhelmingly, um, the candidates said, yeah, we realize this is kind of stepping out in, in faith, and let's do it. And so... 
uh, I have to take my hat off to the candidates who, who are willing to do this because we were learning as we went. We're building the airplane as we're going down mm. the runway, basically, on this thing. And the candidates were fantastic and really helpful with suggestions and whatever. And we had a pilot project in July, which was just you know three months or so later. And that went well. And then we did other exams throughout the year. And we were able to uh, examine every candidate. We're very very relieved. We had kind of been told by external firms that expect about a 10% failure rate, that you're going to have a lot of detritus, you know, left over from this and people won't be able to be, you know, internet connectivity, whatever. You have to figure out ways to examine them later. And we were able to examine all, every candidate, um, you know, who had been signed up for that uh, in 2020. So we've done the same in 2021. Now we've examined totally, I think, more than 1,300 um, candidates. And again, knock on wood, we've been able to examine everyone. Um, this is probably kind of boring, but the psychometrics, uh, the analysis of this exam compared to previous in-person exams are very, very similar. So we're confident that the examination is, uh, is a good one mm. and is defensible and hopefully serves its purpose. Yeah. I, think, a, okay. I was going to say, what a timely transition in advance yeah. being thinking about the virtual platform to be prepared and then, in, you know, as you say, as a kind of leap of faith, step step into it and have it work out. And I, it's obviously the future of what we're going to keep doing for a while. Well, I, again, I have to tip my hat to the ABO staff who just worked like crazy uh, in 2020 and 2021. Lots and lots of overtime extra. In fact, we have a number of our staff who have three or four weeks of vacation they haven't taken that they've earned. They, you know, they have worked hard to make this happen. And our volunteers. We have uh, about 500 volunteers in our, our you know, group right now who are enthusiastic and, and passionate about uh, the mission. The mission being to serve the public mm -hmm. and the profession, but the public first. And uh, the, that they have adapted to this. I mean, uh, learning something new. It's very comfortable. To, you know, you fly to the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. Uh, you would look at the questions you're going to ask. You talk about, you know, this and that with your other examiners and try to make sure you understand, you know, what, what's the right answer, what's the wrong answer for this particular thing and have these. And there's a social aspect to this. People like seeing their colleagues. Uh, they're self-selected to come and do mm -hmm. this. Like I say, they're paying their own way to come and do this. So for the examiners to suddenly flip on a, you know, turn on a dime and to do this from home, to uh, the prep work the week before the exam is intense. It's like every night, you know, there's, there's review sessions. It's a tremendous amount of work for the examiners. Most candidates never see this. Mm -hmm. So I've just, you know, I just can't say enough good about our staff and about our, um, our examiners and our, our board of directors who, again, just have supported this. And thankfully, it's worked yeah. out pretty well so far. Yeah, yeah it's everybody stepped up just like you said, from your staff to the candidates as well. Everybody really stepped up to make this work. And it seems like it's a great option going forward, at least from what I've heard from the candidate side of it, they really like the virtual <laughs> aspect of it. Yeah. They like not having to travel. I did one of the kind of mock virtual exams for ABO back in July, right before the first one came out. And I felt so much less, well, I knew I'd already taken board, so it wasn't real, but I felt less stressed being on a virtual, being in my own environment than waiting outside a, a hotel room. And so I could see how the candidates really like it, but there's a lot of challenges with the virtual exam. I mean, you already mentioned we're losing the camaraderie and the social aspect that the examiners really love. And I'm sure that's a loss. And I, I think people feel that loss. And then also, you I didn't realize this, but you have to burn every question that's put out on a virtual platform, which blows my mind. I still don't understand how you're, how, what, what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> we got to write a lot of questions. It, yeah. Uh, and people think writing questions is easy. Uh, the one thing that's universal among our volunteers when they sort of join the group and they start writing questions or whatever is they go, wow, I didn't realize how hard it was to write a good question. About 90%, I would say, of the questions that come in end up on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Mm -hmm. For a question to actually make it to an exam, it just goes through an unbelievable vetting process of subject matter experts, and then it's field tested, and on and on and on. So it just shows up on an exam, for instance, the first time, and it doesn't count towards the thing. So there are questions on there that are being sort of field tested. Uh, but you're right. The oral exam, we are assuming, unfortunately, we have to assume that somebody might be recording this. Now, that would be, of course, a you know, incredibly disappointing thing in terms of professionalism, but you know, it statistically probably happens. We know that you know people have tried to 
cheat in the past, and that's not great, but it's happened. So we have to think that, well, you know, the exam has to have integrity. You know, for someone who does the proper work and studies, and then if somebody else has an advantage, that just simply isn't appropriate. So uh, up to now, we have been, uh, we've been burning the questions, like you say. We have, a, thankfully, a pretty good bank of them. Uh, but uh, and we have an exam development committee, and again, volunteers who talk about you know people who really are passionate, people who watching them write questions and modify questions is really inspiring uh, to see that happen. But so we're replenishing the bank, and we're thinking of different options going forward. How, how do we make this examination better? It's I think it's going to be hard to go back to in person. However, um, some of my colleague boards um, have done so. They they particularly some surgical boards. I. I went to the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery oral exam a few weeks ago in Chicago. They've been meeting at the Palmer Hotel since about 1523 or something. I mean, they've been there forever. That's where their board was formed. They can point out the room where their board started in 1934, I think it was, or something. But, uh, but their examiners really wanted to be in person, and they felt something was lost because of um, let's say body language, but just the ability for two examiners to talk with a candidate. Now they use a complete case log system. It's not, you know, hypothetical cases like we use. You know, this is a patient with X, Y, and Z who comes in and here's their complaint. What do you do? They actually look at cases that the doctors have accumulated over a year or two prior to the exam, and then they select 12 cases, and the candidates are quizzed, if you will, on on those cases. Why did you order that test? Why did you do this thing in surgery? I noticed your blood loss was whatever. You know, how come? And this sort of thing. It it's really moves the assessment to another level on the so-called Miller's Pyramid of, of sort of assessment where you have mm-hmm. knows, knows how, uh, you know, shows and does. You know? And so, you know, someone, think about it, theoretically, could learn all about ophthalmology and never be an ophthalmologist mm-hmm. and actually pass the exam if they read the books and everything. And they could discuss how to do these things. But you can't if you will, you know, fake it on your own cases. You know, you did a total hip and here's the result, here's the x-ray, you know, why did you use that implant sort of thing. So they, they're there. So we're, we're thinking about, you know, trying to learn from other boards about how, how to improve our examination. Whatever we do, if we do anything, yeah. it will be a long process. It'll be one, again, that will engage the community um, to do the right thing. We want to do this together as a community. It's interesting how that process would bring in self-reflection in addition to just knowledge in that regard. On that theme, you brought up self-regulation and how important that is for our society. And you wrote a piece recently in Ophthalmology on the unfinished history of professionalism. Share with us a little bit about your expertise and perspective on both self-regulation for us as a profession, but also how that's so integrated into profession and our ongoing success and well-being as a as a physician group yeah thanks um yeah that was a fun piece to write i, I just uh kind of during COVID, i i took a deep dive if you will into the history of professionalism and learned of course like why do you write papers you write papers a lot of times just to learn something about something you knew nothing about i learned a lot about where professionalism started way back with the stoics i mean this is you know before the common era it really extraordinary. You know, great ideas are usually around in some form or other for a long time, and it's just how it gets fleshed out over time that's interesting. But uh, the idea of certification, which is only a small part of professionalism in that article, this is not a new idea or a unique idea. Uh, I mean, if you think about, you know, you go back to Leviticus uh, in the Hebrew Bible, where if a member of the community was ill, let's say with whatever they called leprosy at the time, before that person could be readmitted to society, the person had to go to the priest and get a certificate of cleanliness. Think about today. You've got certified public accountants. You have certified USDA certified meat processors. In our state, midwives are certified. Cosmetologists are certified. Look around. Yeah. Every, everything is overseen by somebody. But in medicine, we have this unbelievably... <laughs> extraordinary privilege that we are able to, <clears throat> as it were, regulate ourselves. Look, it doesn't happen very often, and, and, you know, and we could lose this in very easily as, as a profession. But, and it goes throughout the whole process. I mean, medical schools are overseen by something. You know, residencies are overseen by the ACGME. 
um, you know, there's different groups along the way that, that oversee what we do. We're at the Mayo Clinic. You know, we don't waltz in here and start seeing patients. There's an intense credentialing process. We have to do that every couple of years and look at this, you know, and it's out there. So in medicine, we're allowed to do this ourselves. And I think, of course, this is the right way to do it. I, for one, don't really want to have somebody out there who doesn't know anything about what I do regulating that. That, that generally isn't mm-hmm. a great model. So, um, you know, we, we, as I said before, as a profession, have to understand this, uh, embrace it, be engaged, and make it better. Because if we don't do it, somebody else is going to. That, that is absolutely for sure. A vacuum would be there, and that's always filled by something. And I don't think it will be better than what we have. So I'm optimistic we can improve on this, but we got to do it as a medical community, as an ophthalmic community. Now, professionalism is part of that. You know, you look at the different competencies. You're involved. You're our uh, assistant program director now, I guess. Is that right? That's so, right. So what are, what are the competencies? Are you, um, this is, I'm putting you on the spot here. This is great. This is <laughs> yeah. unbelievably uncommon for me to be able to turn a question around, uh, Dr. <laughs> Tooley. So there are competencies, right? That's right. W- is, what are those, you know, is professionalism one of those? It is, actually, yes, yeah. Right. And so, System-based practices, problem-based learning, but professionalism is one of them. That was not, she nails these. And I, 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 we did not talk about this before. She, she had this. So, yeah, but, but, but professional is one of the things that we are supposed to, as educators, um, verify in our residents. So when they finish and the program director signs off on that and the, mm-hmm. and the department chair signs on off on that, then that form comes to us, the ABO, and we say, okay, yes, all these boxes are checked and this person has behaved in a professional manner. Now, it's hard to write a multiple choice question about professionalism or even an oral exam question about it. We have to rely on the programs to do their job, you know, to say, yes, this person, we've observed them for now more than three years with the integrated internship. So three to four years, they've had the chance to see that person in action, you know, when they're tired, when they're fresh, when they're in the OR, when they're under stress, whatever, with different types of patients. And they can assess that better than we can. Again, the community has to do this together. Same thing with surgical skills. You know, we could review videos and all this kind of stuff, but watching somebody in the operating room for several years is really the best way. And this has been known by the ABO forever. If you go back at our documents from the 1950s, 1960s, it's, these problems are not new, and they've been looked at in the same way. So the team effort you know, is involved here. So, I really loved that piece on professionalism. It was a history lesson. <laughs> there were a couple parts I had to read several times. Like, well, what are you talking about here? Um, but there's so many different facets of professionalism, not just how we interact with our colleagues in a physician-to-physician relationship, but then also the patient-physician relationship. And I loved what you said about how the key to trust is professionalism or at the heart of trust between the patient and physician is professionalism. So what does that mean and how is that going to change going forward? I, I see the patient-physician relationship changing so much as we go to more virtual platforms because of COVID. We're doing not face-to-face meetings mm-hmm. as much anymore. And also medicine's just changing. It's more of a service-based model sometimes. I, there's so much change in this. So how do we maintain that trust, that professionalism with, with our patients? Well, that's a $64,000 question. Yeah. I guess that was before inflation. But... but uh, that, that is going to be critical, and it has changed. It certainly changed during my professional practice career. Um, and, you know, like a lot of change, some of it's uncomfortable, but a lot of times, and most of the time, it's actually good. I think now that, you know, patients are, are expected to take more responsibility for their care, but that means that we have to have a more of a partnership uh, with mm-hmm. them. And, of course, all good partnerships are based on trust. So patients are, are hungry, if you will, for you know, information that is valid. They can go out, as you know, and you, we've all seen our patients come in, you know, clutching, you know, the latest article they read on the internet about whatever, and most of the time it's not helpful. So they're looking for, for things that, are, that, are, that they can trust. And, and I think this is what we want to do at the ABO. It's been the mission from the beginning. If you go back again to the founders when they wrote about this, is that this is to provide assurance to the public <clears throat> that a certain that a person has done a certain educational program and finished that appropriately and passed an examination. That was the early thing. Now it's more complicated today. We have to be able to show that we're keeping up. You know, I, I certified in 1986. 
a lot has changed in my, even in oxalo plastics. Some things haven't changed, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot has changed since 1986. And, you know, I voluntarily recertified twice, even before I thought about taking on this job, because I thought it was the right thing to do. I wanted just to see, prove to myself that I was kind of not too far away from the dock. Not the dock exam, but the, you know, the shore, yeah. if you will. <laughs> Uh, and I wanted to be actually simpatico with my younger colleagues who got certified after 1992. That they had to do it, well, I, I should do it too, you know, as one of their colleagues. So, But, you know, I, I think this is where we want them to come to our, um, to the ABO. Pa patients do. I mean, thousands of them <laughs> per year. They look up you and me and everybody. They, they you know, look up our profile and see where they went to medical school and are they certified or not. That's the, that's the first step. They, they, they want to, well, gee, this doctor's certified. That, I guess, is a good thing. That's what they think. So, and we want to be, a, you know, an independent, um, you know, source that they can trust for that, among other things. But this is one, one means of helping to build that trust that is so important. And I didn't make that up. That was Jordan Cohen, you know, who was, I was quoting in that article, mm -hmm. who was the former head of the Ameri AAMC. And, um, Association of American Medical Colleges, and, and he really so beautifully articulated um, our responsibility as physicians to society, this unwritten compact that we have with them based on trust. So anyway, it's critical, critical. I just want to say thank you for this time. I, in your article, you wrote that part of professionalism um, might be characterized by an increasing altruistic uh, motivation over one's career. Yeah. And I just thank you for not only for your patience here and our practice and our colleagues, but truly how your career has been one of growing an altruistic impact, and in this case, through the ABO. So thank you for sharing us, sharing your, this time and your insights in terms of that impact that so many individuals um, at the ABO are doing to advance our profession. Well, thanks to both of you for uh, letting me have this nice conversation with you. Appreciate it. You can find all episodes of the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast on our website. Thank you for listening, and we definitely look forward to sharing more 